still happy that you're here. Um, our talk, all your packets are belong to us. Um, it's about attacking backbone technologies. My partner Daniel and I, Roger, will present you some um, interesting stuff. Maybe you have heard about it, all about the media um, attention. Um, it's about trust model, trust in the backbones, backbone technologies, and uh, we show you also some uh, tools. We show you some demonstration. We have a little lab here, and hope everything will work fine. Thank you. So, um, a short slide about who we are. Um, we're some kind of old school networking geeks. Um, fiddling around with network stuff for a couple of years now. Um, we're working for a Germany-based security company called ERNW, and so we have a lot of fun um, playing with baseband protocols and doing some backbone stuff and yeah, breaking things. That's what it's all about. Of course. Okay, um, let's have a look at, it, at the agenda. First, we will have some short in introduction to the talk and make clear what are the dimensions of this talk. After that, we got two big topics, which are um, BGP and MPLS. Um, we will show the trust model behind these protocols, and we will show you some cool demos, um, some new tools to break these trust models. After that, we got uh, another topic, which is carrier ethernet. Um, we actually don't got a demo for carrier ethernet because this, that would expand our lab um, too much. So we got three big Cisco's to carry it. I think it's enough. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise, we have to bring a, a huge truck to bring all the <laughs> devices here. I think these are enough. Okay. So um, in the end, we got a summary and some outlook. Um, just to make the talk round. Okay, the dimension of this talk is we want just to um, show you how some really cool technologies work, and um, we're sure this is not some kind of esoteric shit. If you think something else, um, please throw things at us. We will recognize this. Um, and we want to entertain you, too. This is why we build in the bingo stuff you will see on the next slide, and um, we will have a lot of demos just to entertain you, to show you some um, real hacking going on, and yeah, you will see in the meat sections. It's all about meat. <laughs> yeah. So um, some of you might know this um, security ex uh, excuse bingo, which is um, cool stuff. If you don't know it, take a look at it. Um, we just got this one and break it into little pieces, which we'll come back later in the talk on, so um, it's just to make some fun of this thing. Yeah, I think everyone has heard about such work like, nobody will ever try to do this, or that's yeah. not possible. Um, uh, maybe yeah. it is. Okay. So, so um, the first thing uh, Ari mentioned is uh, about BGP. What is BGP? Um, BGP is used to um, to bring the internet together. I think 99% uh, of all the internet protocol is based on BGP. BGP is currently used at version 4. Um, I think uh, the best RFC is 4271, and uh, it all describes how BGP works. So BGP is used to fix, to glue the internet together. Everything, every provider um, using the internet infrastructure communicates via BGP. Um, so BGP has an interesting trust model, um, which will be uh, focused some slides later. And um, it was a debate last year uh, when we saw or uh, see some some interesting um, presentation at uh, PH Neutral, which was a um, private um, party, I say, and also at a DEF CON where the media attention was really big about, um, where some guys showed how to um, manipulate the BGP information in the internet to get some traffic redirection. So how works it? How does BGP work? BGP speakers, so-called peers, um, try to bring some relationship between uh, each others, and they have some neighbor peers. And the BGP 
relies uh, over TCP. So you don't have uh, such things like multicasting, like in OSPF, where all the routers saying, oh, hello, I am a router. Um, is there some other router? I have some information about this network and this information. Um, that's not what BGP is doing. BGP is used by manual configuration. So every router in the internet has to be um, configured manually by some administrator or some operator. So it's not really easy to spoof the information at the BGP um, transmission because um, normally you do, you do not really see some information about BGP like this hello stuff. So if all the network is set up, so there are a lot of BGP um, peers communicating with each, with each other, um, there's a so-called network layer reachability um, information um, which um, gives you some, some um, information that the BGP router says, okay, if you want to reach some AS, some autonomous system or some network, um, I know where this information has to go through. So this is uh, what they're doing after the peers are communicating with each other. And uh, this information is used to build the path over the Ethernet to the destination. So the trust model, as I, we said, um, it's all about trust. It's not about hacking MPLS from the outside of the world. It's about trust. Um, the trust model behind BGP is that you have um, a couple of routers set up in the internet and the administrator says, okay, I trust the other administrator from another uh, country or from another um, provider and every administrator have to set up the, the, the peer, the BGP peer manual. So the intra, there is an intra-operator trust by humans. And uh, if this trust is misused by some kind of manipulating, um, you have big problems maybe, like uh, in, the, in the 90s, where is the so-called AS7007 incident, where uh, three-fourths of the internet was down, or like uh, the YouTube incident, where some Pakistani um, routing information reached the, the, the router which are communicating to the world and they said, oh, if you want to reach the network where YouTube is in, come to Pakistan. And all the information in the, I think in, in one third of the world who want to, re to, to reach or to look some, some so watch some videos over to YouTube are going to Pakistan. So and this was 2008. It's what was not uh, in the 90s. So this is our actual or recent problems uh, which we are fighting with. So it's all about trust and nobody knows is the other administrator trustfully. So as I said, the, the media intention about uh, manip manipulating BGP was at DEF CON last year. So what security mechanisms do we have to secure BGP? Um, you can use MD5 signature for integrity checking, but MD5 is not inside of the BGP protocol. It's used only to have some um, authentication about the peers. So you only use MD5 for uh, proving that the peer you're speaking with is the right one. And uh, now you were made uh, thinking, oh, MD5, it's broken. Um, at the 25th um, Chaos Computer um, Congress, they showed how to manipulate um, all the certification manipulating. And um, still, the attack is really, really difficult if you're on a network, on an um, provider network where some BGP information are going over the net. And um, also, there are some um, people on the internet um, and they are trying to bring some more security to BGP. So they are actually working on it. And uh, the MD5 key security is often used by carrier best practices 
And uh, when we are at the customer side and bring up some autonomous system and uh, configuring the BGP router, we often had a, a call to some provider administrator and say, OK, we have set up the BGP router. And uh, can we exchange now the password for the MD5 encryption? And sometimes the provider administrator said to us, hmm, we don't have a process for using MD5 um, authentication in our BGP. And then we said, oh, what? Not? OK, so maybe you are lucky and you have an MD5 authentication on your BGP network. Maybe you're working with some other um, internet provider and uh, you do not have this possibility. So we have set up some interesting meet tools. Uh, mm -hmm. or Daniel has programmed it. So he will tell us about the tool BGP CLI and later on the tool BGP MD5 crack. Yeah. Okay. Um, enough theory. Let's get into practice. Um, first, I want to demonstrate you a tool which is called uh, BGP CLI, the command line interface for BGP. It's just a little um, Python CLI which um, enables you to speak with a BGP enabled peer. Um, it can yeah, peer with an with an BGP peer. It can insert some BGP information, and of course, you can yeah, use and brute force the MD5 keys. Okay, so we will switch to the first demo. Hopefully. So it's Murphy's Law. Yeah. We, we actually um, prefer okay. to make it working. OK. OK, so um, I will first launch up the BGP CLI, which is this little nice Python shell. Um, after that, I have to configure some global parameters. I have to set up my session with two params. The first is my AS number I'm using. And the second one is just <coughs> my hold timer. I'm using a really short hold timer just for debugging purposes that I don't have to wait, actually, I don't know, uh, three minutes for my BGP session to terminate. So after I set up my um, global session information, I can connect to a BGP-enabled peer. So the BGP connection is established. There are some hello packages exchanged. And the keep alive thread is started in the background to keep the BGP session open. Um, after I got connected to a BGP speaking peer, I can build up my BGP message. In this case, it's a BGP update message, um, which just says, OK, hello, peer. Um, I got some new routing information, and which is I am your next hop for this network. And this network actually is a Square24 network. So once I build these update messages, I can send them out to the BGP speaking peer. And after that, I will shortly switch back to Roga. He will show you that the router actually got a new peer popping up and um, accept this routing information. So let's switch back. And of course, use the auto detection of the monitor of Apple. A couple of seconds. Here we are. OK, I'm now um, connected to a uh, Cisco device, which is an, uh, an, an, an uh, um, MPLS device. And as you see, um, the information said, oh, here's some new BGP5 um, chance is here. And there's a new neighbor with the IP address 10002. And this one is now up. If I go and show IP route. I will see now there's a new BGP route. So and um, this route pronounces the network I just um, put into my updates statement and you see the next hop is my IP address. So actually I could redirect traffic for this destination network to my own host. Which okay. will be shown later on. Yeah. Right. Okay, so um, 
Once I terminate the BGP CLI, you will see the uh, peer goes down and the routing information is lost. So there is no more route for the destination network. Okay, next thing is you say, oh yeah, okay, all right. Um, so I'll switch back to Daniel. Yeah. Um, okay, but we are using MD5. So, um, okay, I just changed my IP address, so I'm now an other BGP peer which is configured with an MD5 key. And if I try to open the session the same as this uh, as last time, so set up session parameter and try to connect to the peer, I will run into a timeout. This is because I don't send the right MD5 signature option. Um, there are some things y you could do. You could do some um, online brute forcing, uh, which means just try to connect to that peer with some randomized um, BGP secret. Um, the other thing you can do, which is the better way, is just to sniff one of the SYN packets from your BGP peer because it's sending you all the time. We want to establish a BGP connection. And these SYN packages are also MD5 signed. So if you get one of these packages, you can just do an offline brute forcing with the tool um, BGP MD5 crack. It just takes a PCAP file. This is a pre-recorded BGP MD5 SYN packet. And in this case, I will do a word list brute force with a prepared word list. So I will start this. The tool just tries to uh, enumerate the right MD5 secret for this SYN packet. And you see after around six seconds, it got around four million tries and found the right secret for this connection. OK, the next thing is we will just transfer that secret back to the um, BGP CLI and set secret for the known peer. And after that, we can set up the session parameters and connect to the peer. So once we are connected, we can do the same game as last time, build our update statement, and send out the update. So when we switch back to Roga... After um, a couple of seconds. Yes. <laughs> um, you will see there, is, there are some uh, error messages, which says, OK, um, Okay. A bad MD5 digest. This was the first attempt where I got no um, MD5 secret configured. And after that, you see, okay, new neighbor is coming up, and the show IP route will show you the inserted BGP route. So again, we are in a situation where we can redirect traffic on a global scope. Yeah, and uh, the really interesting thing about this is we can perform an an offline brute force attack which is not detected on the network. Normally if you're doing a brute force attack against a device, um, some logging mechanisms will show the administrator or some, some, some tool you're using um, to detect such brute force attacks. Um, oh, beware, there's some attacker on the network. Um, we're sniffing a SYN packet and do the, um, the brute force offline. So nobody will ever see that we are now um, can can use the key to do such an attack. Yeah, but uh, for complete mistake, um, the interesting thing is um, we're doing a, a lot of um, on-site um, consulting and penetration testing, and um, at a 40k user environment, a really big company in uh, Germany, um, they are. Um, using also some MPLS and some uh, BGP. And when we were auditing their, their configuration on the Cisco devices, we found such a password. Why does it used or be used to um, Cisco, such a simple password? Um, the answer is simple. Um, the company used um, the the support from a big consulting um, company also, and they are all over the um, all over the world to support companies by building up some MPLS and BGP networks. And they have a guide, and this guide describes how to set up a BGP and MPLS network. 
And uh, if they are bring up this configuration, maybe they bring also this default password, Cisco, because the Cisco password is in that documentation. So we are seeing everywhere this uh, consulting company um, was in to bring up an MPLS and BGP network. The same passwords are used and the same passwords are Cisco. Um, funny enough. So, um, time to switch over to the next topic, to the next focus point. It's MPLS. What is MPLS? MPLS, in short, is uh, multi-protocol label switching uh, described uh, mostly in RFC uh, 3031. And um, it's mainly used for forwarding um, packets, forwarding packets based on labels. So if there are some um, information on the network and the, the information drops on a router, the router sees all the destination of this packet is some other MPLS router and I have to label it. It's almost like the same like an, um, um, yeah, like, like labeling, you put some, some information on that packet. And um, a lot of carriers are now providing, since a long time, this technology MPLS. And uh, MPLS is also subverted into another technologies. Um, there are so-called MPLS layer 3 VPNs or some MPLS layer 2 VPNs which are focused later on in the talk. And um, all these, these technologies and the substances of the technology can be found in a lot of companies which are used to bring some local infrastructure um, to a better state and also at some enterprise or carrier networks. And to look what can we do if we are inside of such a network with this label information um, will be part of this. Um, slides. MPLS layer 3 VPNs are the base technology on RFC 4364 and um, has its own terminology key. So you can use uh, frame relay or AT, AT, um, ATM information also, but MPLS is the better way. It's a newer technology. So you have a high virtual infrastructure inside of this MPLS and you have to compare that everything you are configuring on the MPLS router is on his, the, the right state. So you also have to use additional MPLS labels. So there's a label on the label um, to establish a lot the logical parts and the circuits to get into this network. So it's also feasible with other top, uh, topologies to have an information crossing the MPLS network. To get some focused um, information about the MPLS network, there are some um, different routers of the network which are, can be used. Um, so you have the CE router, which is a customer equipped uh, device, which stands on the customer side and uh, you have a PE router. The PE router is at the border of the MPLS cloud. So the customer um, device and the PE device are communicating with each other. And um, there are some C networks, which are the customer networks and the P networks, um, which are the provider network. So all these um, parts of the MPLS network are used to build up a working MPLS. In MPLS layer 3 VPNs, you have a lot of information. The information are located on the PE router and um, this information are some for VRF, virtual um, routing forwarding information. And um, you use this information to bring up uh, the a logical routing table for each customer and a customer can be located here at a VPN A and a VPN B. So you have a couple of uh, customers located and directed to one PE and th the only the uh, VRF information separates the, um, the customer from each other. So you have virtual VPN routing tables and you have 
a global routing table because the, the PE routers and the P routers also have to communicate with each other. So a more complex view is this one. You have a lot of components inside of the MPLS and to make sure that the PE devices are communicating with each other and to um, transfer the information about the VRFs and how to reach some networks are used by the multi-protocol BGP um, protocol and there are some separate sessions to transfer this information. So you can also have two customers in two different VPNs with the same network information. So both are um, in the network 10.2.0.0 and both the one is located in, in uh, VPN A and the other one is located in VPN B. So it's not um, not really um, useful if you are saying, okay, we have to separate every customer with um, some network information. Um, you can use a couple of the uh, same network information on different customers inside of this MPLS network. Okay, um, what's about the MPLS VPN trust model? If you are going to an provider and you're saying to them, oh, we want to, to buy some MPLS or we want to implement MPLS inside of our network, um, they all assumed it's trusted. The core is trusted. So everyone um, says MPLS is a trusted framework. There is not possible to have some attacks um, outside of the core um, for inside and it's um, no additional security available. So um, if you're using MPLS, you have no encryption or something else inside the MPLS network. As we said, you can use MD5, but MD5 is not really hard to break. Okay. Um, um, ju just to make this clear, we are not talking about uh, how to get inside the MPLS cloud and to perform such attacks, we are assuming we are inside the cloud. If you're just a customer and using the interface provided by uh, um, MPLS um, uh, infrastructure service, um, then you got no chance to get inside the cloud. You're just talking from um, one location to another um, about, uh, by using this cloud and you get separated in your own VPN. Um, so again, we are not talking about how to get in this position. We're talking about what we can do if we are inside the, um, core. the core network. Yes, and um, there are always the debates between some network people and some security people and the network people will always say um, if they are asked is MPLS secure and what, what's about the attacks these guys are showing us um, they will say oh hmm, nobody will ever do this and uh, you're paranoid but you, it's not that paranoid you are thinking um, if I go back to this here um, what, what is possible you can um, or when we are at some, some customer sites and we are bringing up some MPLS networks, um, we're going to providers and then sometimes we are asking, oh, is it possible to bring such a PE on the customer side, on our side, um, for security purposes because we want to control the PE. And uh, when we ask a, a couple of um, providers, one third will say, mm, no, that's not possible. The second third, sometimes say, hmm, we don't think that's possible. I can ask, but I don't think so. And uh, the third will say, yes, maybe. We have to look, but I think we can do this. So um, at some customers, there are PEs at the customer side. So they have control over the PE. And this means if you have control over the PE, you can control the core of the MPLS network. So we are not paranoid. And uh, to show you what's 
possible if you are inside the, the, the car, so if you own an own um, PE router or you get somehow access to the car, then it will show us another tool which is called MBL MPLS redirect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as mentioned before, it assumes that you are inside the car. You need car access for this demo. Um, so, you're too fast. Um, the MPLS redirect is a simple command line tool. It is written in C because it has to be fast. And it's all about modification of VPN labels. So, it redirects traffic from one customer VPN into another customer VPN. Think about you just bought your new high-speed MPLS VPN from location Amsterdam to location Brussels, and you think, okay, I'm secure, it's VPN, it's my virtual private network, and nobody will ever see the data I'm transmitting over this VPN. Now, um, there is a second customer which uses the same MPLS backbone network and got its own VPN. Um, if you got core access, you can actually manage it to redirect data from the one VPN into the another VPN. So we will show you that. Um, first, this is our lab setup. We got um, two different VPNs. The one is red, the other is green. Um, we call them Beer and Spliff, as this talk was um, originally held on Black Hat in Amsterdam. So this was a really um, sense for definition of the VPNs. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, we got some PE routers, we got some P routers, which are part of the uh, MPLS cloud. <coughs> okay, so we will demonstrate you now that there is some um, ping from location red to location red is working. So this is like the setup should work. Yes, um, to show you what um, I'm located on, I'm located with my laptop uh, with a serial console on this PE because if you're using also the, the CEs here on the on the lab, there are a lot of uh, more devices to set up. So I'm located or connected to this PE via serial, and uh, my notebook is um, this CE. So this one, this here is my IP address. So. This is actually the PE router. No. So, um, And we will ping now from the red VPN into the other location of the red VPN. So this is working as expected. That's the normal behavior. You can ping your um, own other side. Maybe um, the upper one is Amsterdam and the downer one is Brussels. So you can communicate from one side to the other. Yes, the statement red in the ping command was um, if there's um, created a ping statement on this router, uh, make sure only if it comes from the red VPN, it will be forwarded in the red VPN. So, so we are simulating um, this CE. Okay, the next step is trying to ping from um, a red VPN into the green VPN. So we have to switch uh, my notebook to another... No, no, not no? that. Ah, okay, yes. I'm too, f too fast. You're too fast. Okay. Okay, so we're just trying to ping from the red VPN in to the green VPN, and um, as you could imagine, this won't work. So all the pings are timed out. Yes. Okay. So, again, it's a normal behavior. Um, now there is some magic come into play, which are the MPLS redirect tools. So I will switch over to my notebook and launch up two instances of the MPLS redirect. Um, I got just a few arguments, which are the interface, the incoming and the outgoing interface, and the incoming and the outgoing VPN label, 
which is incoming label 19. Okay, if there is a packet labeled with label 19, I will um, relabel it with the label 20 and put it back onto the wire. So that's um, the first two instances for um, one way of the communication, and I will launch up a second instance of this tool just for um, the second data flow of the communication. So um, we need two unidirectional um, communication streams, so I need to launch up two tool instances. Okay, after the tools are running, I will switch back to Roga. Here we okay. are. The first thing you see is there is no warning. The PEs don't even uh, mention my tool instances. It's absolutely transparent. Okay, now we will ping again in the red VPN, which is uh, working like before. And after that, we will ping in the green VPN. And as you see, this ping is working too. So, what happened here? Um, no. Um, yes. To make clear, uh, what is about this redirection? Um, you have this um, VPN labels, these MPLS labels, and these labels are based on um, the information which in, uh, VPN, which uh, VP, um, MPLS VPN, the red one and the green one, is sep separated. So. It's all about the labels. There is no other um, encryption in these VPNs or something else, just the labels. Okay, so after there was some magic, we are um, in a state where we can reach the other customer side. So think about it's like, um, I don't know, the um, IBM network is now connected to the Intel network. So just by relabeling traffic. Yes. Okay. So, what does it mean? Um, what does it mean if someone inside the cloud can relabel this information and uh, you can use this information to set up some maybe fake central authentication portal? You can um, use this information to grab all the, the, the corporate passwords. Um, and use them for your own purposes. You can set up a DNS and look for all the DNS information uh, transferred to uh, or inside of the, the network, or you can use it yeah, for, for the sure you can answer the DNS requests. Yeah. Um, so you can use your own ima imagination of what you are, can do if you are can relabeling all the, the packets and uh, can send or receive information. So um, we were on this state and said, okay, this is quite cool because if you got an own VPN inside the MPLS cloud, um, you could just insert some data into another VPN. But in this scenario, you also need a VPN. But wouldn't it be nice if you could just um, insert some traffic inside a VPN without owning another VPN? Yeah, it's, it's possible. Um, I wrote another tool, which it's called MPLS TUN. The TUN is for a tunnel. And what it does, it also assumes you're inside the core. Just remember, all the time we are talking about um, breaking MPLS, you need access to the core. <coughs> so um, what this tool does is um, it just creates a new virtual interface, tunnel interface, and this tunnel interface gives you, uh, or is part of a MPLS VPN, it gives you an MPLS VPN enabled uh, network stack. Um, it's only tested on Linux so far, but I think there should be um, no big problems by porting this to um, BSD or some other platforms. Um, okay, so we got another demo for this. So uh, I will switch back to my notebook and launch up the MPLS TUN command. So um, it got uh, quite a lot of arguments. Um, so the first one is we are now in layer 3 MPLS. 
VPN mode, which means um, we are launching up a layer 3 interface and not a layer 2 interface. Um, we are using uh, input and output interface again, which is my bridging interface. We get some incoming and outgoing labels, which are 19 and 70 in this case. And to actually communicate with the next hop inside the MPLS cloud, you also need the Ethernet addresses of your next hop, and you need the Ethernet address of the next hop in the other direction, because you need to um, separate the answering traffic. Okay, so once I uh, started this tool, it just launched up a um, virtual interface. In this case, oh, sorry. Um, I think I must have one running in the background, yes. Okay, so we got a new tunnel interface, which is TUN0 in this case, and uh, this enables us to insert traffic into an MPLS VPN. So the next thing I do, I'm just assigning an IP address to this interface. I'm setting the MTU because there is um, some MPLS label attached to the network traffic, so we can't use the full Ethernet MTU. Uh, after that, I will add some routing information to my local machine, that traffic to the other side um, remember, this is the network where Roger's notebook is, is located in. Um, so I need to add the route that all traffic to this network is inserted into the tunnel. And after I set it up the tunnel interface, which is this one, I'm able to oh, actually ping the other side of the MPLS VPN. So this means I'm not owning an own MPLS VPN, I'm just sitting somewhere inside the MPLS cloud and injecting traffic into some customer VPN. Now I, I got the choice. Um, do I want to take part with the IBM VPN or do I want to take part with the um, Cisco VPN or whatever? So just imagine, there are some really big companies um, using these technologies to um, connect some sites together and we're just sitting here inside the core and got access to all these VPNs and as you see we can use standard um, tools within these MPLS enabled network stack. <laughs> yes and again um, the redirection of the MPLS labels was only sitting on the network and waiting for traffic and now we are able to inject some traffic into this network. So let's see. Just run some Nmap instances and okay you see it's a Mac OS so it can't be my notebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's switch back. Okay, um, what are the mitigating controls? Um, a lot of people ask us, okay, what can we do? If, if you showed us um, this, this funky, pretty cool tricks, um, what can we do? Um, the simple answer is trust your carrier. If you can trust your carrier, you do not have a problem with all this because um, you can say, okay, if my information comes over the network of the carrier, um, someone has to be um, first to make sure that there is no possibility to attack the network. Um, so you can um, say to the, to the customer, we need some contractual controls in it. Um, make sure that everything is secure. If not, if there is some, something happened, you have to pay us a defined amount of money because of um, this attacking information. Um, the another thing is you can authenticate everything, but this maybe breaks the trust model. The trust model was everything inside um, the MPLS is secure. That's what the provider tells us. Um, now we have seen it's not so secure maybe, 
um, if an attacker have access to the car or is inside of the MPLS network. Um, and this, again, breaks the approach of the trusted networks. Another thing is that you can use some borders of trust, again, use some layer 3 devices for encrypting all the traffic, but the network administrators will say, oh, we are implemented MPLS to throw this VPN devices, which are doing IPsec or something else, um, to throw it away. Now you are saying, we are using MPLS and we have to use some encryption inside the MPLS. Um, that's too expensive. So you have to, make, to choose your own mitigating control. And uh, yeah. If you uh, think it's secure enough, um, you're fine. We're yeah. fine too. It's, it depends on your risk um, analysis. The third part of the presentation is about uh, carrier Ethernet and the definition of uh, carrier Ethernet. Carrier Ethernet um, means that um, some Ethernet frames are transported across the carrier, uh, mostly um, one carrier. Sometimes a lot of carriers are cooperating. But you can transport your Ethernet frames from one point of the MPLS to another point of the MPLS. So Ethernet is not only used as an access medium, it's used as a service. And these services are somehow um, depending on the, on, the, um, on the provider or uh, the implementation called a Metro Ethernet or Ethernet over MPLS or um, virtual um, <coughs> Ethernet frames. Um, you can use some, some layer 2 tunneling protocol version 3. So all this, this kind of um, technologies are used for carrier Ethernet. And um, a simple example for carrier Ethernet is at one side uh, you have some enterprise LAN and here is also an enterprise LAN and it's all one Ethernet segment where all the frames are uh, crossing over the MPLS network. So the red data path could be seen as just a virtual circuit. Yes. And the, the most important thing about this is uh, the change of the trust model. In the past, you have two zones of trust. The layer 3 device is the border um, where your trust zone ends. So Ethernet frames from customer A um, will never reach the trust zone of uh, customer B. So they are separated. You have a clear instant of your frames. And if you're using this um, carrier Ethernet, your zone of trust implements now that there's another zone the carrier zone. So you have to trust the carrier um, that he uses and provides the Ethernet frames correctly and secure. So the layer 3 devices, sorry, the layer 3 devices are now exchanged through layer 2 devices. It's all one zone of trust. And uh, that means that there's <coughs> new threats are involving and have a new scope. Ethernet-based attacks are um, maybe performed over the MPLS cloud. So um, an attacker sit, uh, sits in one um, location at the MPLS cloud and the target is located on another um, side of the access um, MPLS cloud. So you can do some app spoofing. Or what if you have some um, different configuration of uh, VTP and you plug in some old switch or some, some switch with some VTP configuration and this switch is uh, reconfigurating every switch in all the MPLS network. Or if you have some, some network protocols like spanning tree which is designed in the 80s um, which was not designed for such complex um, communication um, over the MPLS, if you have a spanning tree root bridge at one side, all the information may flow over the whole MPLS network to another side. So um, segregation of the networks is not anymore possible. You have one whole layer 2 network 
all over the MPLS. So that's the attack I talked about. If you sit somewhere inside Bristol, um, you can make some attacks over the cloud and up spoof maybe some um, communication, which is normally from this server to this server, goes over the MPLS cloud, again back to the attacker. We are um, used this uh, attacks, um, or we, we, show, we, we looked at this uh, attacks are possible and yes they are. Uh, we tested with uh, Yersinia, maybe you know it, and uh, it works. Okay, um, there is uh, the tool MPLS Town again, which is also um, capable to open uh, layer 3 virtual interface, which is part of such a virtual circuit over the MPLS cloud. So you're also able to um, inject some layer 2 Ethernet frames into these virtual circuits and take part on the virtual um, Ethernet network. So, and just for completeness, there is another co tool called um, LDP CLI, which is a command line interface for the LDP protocol. Um, LDP is the protocol used to, um, to um, distribute the um, virtual circuit information over the MPLS cloud. So, um, if you're inside the cloud and use both of these tools, you're able to peer with one PE router and take part on a virtual circuit. So, again, you're able to inject Ethernet frames from the cloud into some customer network. Okay, um, some wrap-up on Ethernet, uh, carrier Ethernet. It's a really interesting approach. It's a really cool technology. Um, think about you're using an Ethernet cable which goes from Amsterdam to New York. You can't do this with a physical cable. You need such technologies. And just, we are old school networkers, as I said, we really like that um, technologies. But it changed your whole trust model. You have to trust your provider. Okay, so we got one demo less, uh, left. We saved it for the last because we think it's actually the coolest one. So, and in the past, everyone said, okay, nobody will ever try to do this. And we will have some fun with multi-protocol BGP. Uh, multi-protocol BGP is the protocol used for mm, peering some um, layer 3 VPNs, actually for distributing the information. Okay, I got a site, Russell, which is connected to customer Intel. And if you want to reach this site, please use the label 15. Um, what we'll do now is Roga will show you all the um, all the um, layer 3 VPN routing information on one PE. And after that, I will launch up my tool again. So, now this is the global routing table. Please show routing table for VRF red. So, right. Okay, you see we got two sides. One is directly connected, it's the 112 network, and one is reachable via another MPLS-speaking PE, it's the 113 network. Okay, I will switch to my notebook and launch up BGP CLI again. Um, now, because we are speaking multi-protocol BGP, I need to set up some parameters first which are just saying, okay, I'm including some information into my hello packages, which are saying I'm multi-protocol capable, I also can do some um, route refresh feature, and so on. This is necessary for the um, remote peer to establish a multi-protocol BGP session with us. After that, I set up the global session parameters again, and I'm getting connected to the other peer. So, nothing new until now. Now I will paste in this little nice BGP update statement, which just says, okay, um, I got a new location. I got a site called, I don't know, Munich, and this site, Munich, got this IP address inside, so please, all traffic to this IP address redirect to site Munich. And site Munich is 
actually reachable via the next hop, 10.10.10.10, which is my IP address. So after setting up this BGP update statement and sending it out, we'll switch back to Roger's notebook. And the good thing about um, this talk is we have a break after this, so we can have a, some overtime. Maybe. No, no. <laughs> we, we, we won't. We won't need it. <laughs> okay. So. As you can see, there's, uh, again, a neighbor up and a next hop maybe reachable. Yeah, there is something. Um, I'm actually not taking part on the um, uh, backbone OSPF routing process, so I can't distribute a loopback address. So I need to use my real physical address in the um, MPLS cloud. This is why the Cisco device says, oh, there may be something misconfigured. But um, as you see, there is a new route popping up, which includes exactly the IP address um, injected. So this is actually a new site, a third site in the MPLS VPN spawning up just by injecting some multi-protocol BGP packages. And uh, we now can take part on the um, whole um, MPLS VPN stuff and we yeah, are spawning up a new site. Okay, um, there is a net 80.0.0.0 square 8 located on site Munich. And if you ever try to reach some official IP address inside this square 8, all the traffic got redirected to site Munich. This is pretty cool. I don't think so. Okay. Um, so, uh, we got some summary and outlook left. Um, all these um, new funky um, backbone technologies got their got really cool features and we need such technologies in uh, nowadays, but they got a debatable trust model. And what we want to do is just make your intent of this. Just give you something to think about. Think about your trust model. Think about if you trust your carrier and if you don't trust your carrier, you need to do something um, against these attacks. It's just that simple. We want to make you aware of this. Yeah, to know you, um, you that you know uh, what's possible. So, okay, we got some um, final wisdom left. It's just taken from um, RFC 1925, and it says, okay, uh, you can't actually fully understood what's going on in the net network if you don't um, run such an operational network. So, um, if you're really interested in this stuff, get your hands on some, on, on some devices and look what's possible. So, this is and uh, just follow the simplicity principle from um, another RFC called um, 3439. Uh, just read about that. Okay, so we're finished. There is never time enough. I could do some a uh, lot of more cool demos, but I hope this is enough for now. Um, are there any questions? Uh, for all the BGP stuff, uh, nowadays most of the carriers filter out the prefixes that are announced by a BGP peer uh, using uh, Cisco uh, prefix lists. Uh, so uh, if the operator used that principle correctly, we are pretty safe, aren't we? Yeah, that, that's right. Um, there is some um, prefix filtering going on on the global BGP instances, but um, we have done some, some audits on uh, MPLS backbone networks and we've never seen some filtering inside the backbone network. Yes, and also um, filtering is uh, control and not trust. So if you trust someone, you don't have to control him. It's, it's uh, the kind of mitigating control um, by filtering, but as Daniel said, in MPLS uh, backbones, mostly you don't uh, do not see this. So you, you assume a trusted core. Why should you filter? I, I was more speaking about the, the internet BGP yeah. model. The, the, the global BGP global routing BGP mechanism. Routing. Yeah. That's right. There is a lot of filtering going on, but as the incident uh, mentioned earlier in the talk shows, not all um, carriers are doing that filtering. Otherwise, there couldn't be such incidents. Yeah, big carriers trust each other. 
Yes. Right. It's all about trust. Thanks. Can you say anything about the impact um, on your attacks in IP version 6 with the privacy implemented or not? Um, first, it should be the same impact on IPv6 because um, it's you can use IPv4 or IPv6 over MPLS. It's it's um, it's the same in the end because um, your MPLS label is sitting between the Ethernet um, header and the IP header. So um, you can transport anything over MPLS, even I don't know ATM or PPP, and so. It, it doesn't depend on the layer 3 protocol. Yes, and uh, um, to, to make clear, in uh, 2006 uh, at, uh, at the Black Hat in Amsterdam, we, we said, oh, it's theoretically possible to do such attacks, and everyone said, yeah, it's uh, theoretically possible, but nobody will ever try to do this. And then we are uh, um, said, okay, we, we have to, to build up some tools. Daniel built these tools for IP version 4. Uh, maybe the next tools will be uh, working with IP version 6. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Over there. <coughs> um, you mentioned that in oh. some customers, uh, in some just, just wait so the audience can listen to. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that in some customers' networks, they actually have the providers, or the PE, on the customer site. Yep. What type of controls do you recommend that organizations should be expecting from their providers, given that it may not be my site that has their PE, but it may be another customer of theirs, and therefore that puts me at risk? So what kind of controls do you recommend? Um, if you give away your PE devices, you're lost. Yes, never give away your PE. If no. if someone other have access to the PE, um, he's able to have control inside of the MPLS core. And and so, obviously, you've come across situations where you are seeing PE devices on the customer site. Yep. Is the provider using any kind of, you know, anti-tampering or, you know, I'm being really optimistic here. The no. There is, no. There is no mechanism for anti-tampering on MPLS level. Uh, also in the hardware. You can just plug in your, your, your serial um, cable and uh, configure it. So, last question. Of the assessments that you've done of MPLS, how many, t I don't know, I guess as a percentage, how much are you seeing PEs actually on the customer site? Oh, it depends on the service provider. There are service provider who said, uh, no, you're a customer, you will never ever get a PE. But there are service provider who said, okay, if you pay uh, enough money, you will get a PE. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay. Okay, any more questions? No more. No more. So okay. Thank you. Thank and you. Where is the beer? <laughs> <laughs>